Good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to this informational hearing of the Health and Human Services Finance Division of the Minnesota House. I'm glad to see everyone here today. Um, I see we have some members at the table who are not members of this committee. I have no problem with you sitting where you want to sit, but we're only going to be entertaining questions from committee members today, just so everyone is clear. Um, uh, as we're starting here, as all of you know, this is the first meeting at which we have a notable absence from one of our members, Representative Diane Loeffler, who passed away recently and um, quite unexpectedly for most of us. And so it's kind of a somber beginning to this meeting. I wanted to take a few moments. We have some flowers over here at her seat. And um, she will be so greatly missed on this committee and in this body and in many other places as well. So I wanted to start out by giving members a few minutes to um, speak about Representative Loeffler. Um, but we're going to try to keep this brief because we do have a lot of business before the committee today. So. Um, I have a list here. I'm going to first um, call on Representative Haley. That's okay to start. We don't have an order and nobody knows. Here's, here are the members that I have who want to make a statement. Let me just say that first. I have Haley, Hamilton, Baker, Zerwas, Schultz, and then I'll, I'll finish up with a few words. Um, okay, Representative Grunhagen, you want to say something as well? Okay. Um, um, I'll stick you in there as well someplace. It won't be controversial. Okay, well, <laughs> all right, Representative Haley, please proceed. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted to acknowledge Representative Loeffler's absence and to say as a, a newer member when I first met her and through my term, she always had a smile. And uh, we all know the complexities of this committee and I just felt like Representative Loeffler uh, had a passion for the possibilities in helping people. And she always took the time to explain that there always was a possibility to help, and I appreciated that about her nature. Thank you for the opportunity to recognize her. Thank you, Representative Haley. Representative Hamilton. Thank you, Madam Chair. You know, Madam Chair, um, you and I and Representative Loeffler, we were all elected the same year, came in as freshmen together, and I don't know if you recall, but uh, at our freshman orientation, uh, the bus broke down, and former Representative uh, Denise Dietrich uh, had a vehicle there, and it was you and I, and uh, Representative Loeffler and Representative Poppy, I believe, that all rolled back in that vehicle. I was the only man and the only uh, the only Republican in that car, but uh, um, we formed a special bond, I believe, uh, and I think that trip was was part of it. And and you know, Representative Loeffler was always thoughtful, kind, caring, and a true champion of the people. And uh, she'll be greatly missed, so thank you for taking the time, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Hamilton. Representative Zerwas. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and um, I think one of the things, as I think about uh, Representative Loeffler, um, is I kind of, sometimes when I present bills, I like to take some things that are somewhat complex and try to come up with a way to really make it simple. And so it might be a really complex uh, policy concept involving the counties and you kind of make it really simple and we just want to change this and this and, and that way we'll just be able to do that. The problem was that Representative Loeffler had so much in-depth knowledge about the minute inner workings between DHS and the counties and the inner workings of the counties is you could never slip one by her. <laughs> <laughs> and, and she would always, uh, you know, with a smile on her face and, and as cordial as can be, but point out, well, that's not really how it works. It's actually a lot more complex than that. And it kind of provide this, this background and real in-depth information back to the counties that I learned, um, especially um, over the last several years, to use as a resource um, and to go with her, go to her with with questions or, or quite frankly, when there are things I didn't understand. And uh, and sometimes she would bring up issues with with bills I was working on that I would just try to talk my way out of, and then go and then go up to her afterwards. You know, 
yeah, okay, that sounds serious. How do we fix that? And, uh, and, then, and then I think the most impressive thing is whether it was helping a Republican or helping a Democrat, her end goal uh, was good public policy to help Minnesotans. And I think she, uh, over her career, certainly achieved that. And we're a better body uh, because of uh, her career uh, in the Minnesota House. Thank you, Representative Sir Was. Um, Representative Grunhagen. Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, I won't reiterate some of the things that have already been said. I just say ditto. It, uh, everything that has been said is true of uh, Representative Loeffler. Uh, she will be greatly missed. And uh, just a couple words. Uh, she was kind. She was concerned for the less fortunate. She was dedicated. She was principled. And, uh, you know, even though at times we had disagreements, when somebody demonstrates those types of uh, characteristics uh, that Representative Lothbrook did, I still have a lot of respect for them. And uh, she'll be missed, and I think uh, she was a great resource for this HHS committee. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Grunhagen. Representative Schultz. Thank you, Madam Chair. So I've known uh, Representative Diane Loeffler for five years, and you know, she had so much depth and breadth of knowledge in health and human services that she was always the go-to person to explain things. And as we tackle disability waivers, she will really be missed. She dedicated her career as a legislator and as an advocate to improve the lives of people in her district and people throughout the state. Um, she was a very kind um, and generous person and I worked very closely with her and, and Chair Liebling throughout my five years, uh, so I know how hard she worked for people in her district and the state. Um, she was a tireless advocate, not just a legislator. She would never give up, and she always had hope and faith in this body that, sh that never, um, never changed, and she will definitely be missed here and for the people of Minnesota, um, and we should always remind ourselves why we're here and that we're here to help those who are the most vulnerable, those who have the largest barriers and obstacles in their life. And that's what we're here to do, to try to improve the people and their lives. And that's what Representative Diane Loeffler would want us to do here today. So just keep that in mind um, as we go through this uh, committee hearing today. Thank you, Representative Schultz. I have a, a few more members that would like to say something. Representative Knorr. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Representative Lofla represented the other side of the district that I do represent. And she was a strong advocate for Northeasters and at the same time for the whole state. Uh, she will be deeply missed. I wanted to send my condolences to Mike Witts and his uh, family and everybody else that she left behind. Uh, she was my mentor in many ways. She kept on informing me about issues at the state level, even before I became a state legislator. So uh, I'm really sad that we lost a strong advocate for everyone who is here in Minnesota. Thank, Thank you. you, Representative Noor. Representative Kunish Badin. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I would just like to recognize Diane Loeffler as well. We shared um, a border, um, me being in St. Anthony and Columbia Heights and her in Northeast Minneapolis. But I lived in Northeast Minneapolis for, for a couple of decades myself, and I know the kind of impact that she had on that very, very diverse community. Her love for um, for the the parks and her advocacy for the river and uh, for the library system will not be um, forgotten very quickly. And I think any one of us sitting here today can acknowledge her as a as a true mentor and very generous with her her historical knowledge of what makes this. Um, this committee so important to the lives of Minnesotans. And so uh, thank you for the opportunity to remember her. Thank you, Representative kunish Padin, Representative Cantrell. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I just want to say that Representative Loeffler represented the very best of this legislature. And there's something I think so incredibly reflective of the true essence of her spirit that while she herself was fighting for her life um, in, a, in a quiet, dignified battle. She was also fighting for the lives of all Minnesotans, especially those who had been neglected and left behind uh, so extensively um, in our state and 
and in our cities. Um, and she, she will have a legacy that will live on uh, in the lives of all those who, who are able to know security and prosperity as a result of her work in the legislature. Um, so may she, may she rest in peace and uh, thank you for taking the opportunity or taking a little bit of time to um, reflect on, on her passing. Thank you, Representative Cantrell, and thank you, members, and just, I, I know that every single member here would actually have a lot to say about Representative Loeffler, and, you know, we, we didn't want to take too much time here this morning, so some of you have uh, decided not to speak, even though I know that the feelings run very deep here. Um, I just want to conclude by saying that, um, as Representative Hamilton mentioned, we are part of the same class. I was elected the same year as Representative Loeffler, 2004, started in 2005 here. And um, Diane, of course, I came in knowing nothing about this process. Diane came in knowing everything, it seemed, about this process. And so I was blown away by her from the very first day. She seemed to know everything. She'd been a lobbyist, she'd been an analyst, she just knew so much. So she really was a resource to me and to all of us that have known her. The word mentor's been used a few times. She was definitely a mentor to me. And uh, I just want to relate one small story. Um, we served on many, many health and human service committees together, probably Representative Hamilton. You are probably on most of them, too. And uh, so when uh, we were on the uh, Health and Human Services Reform Committee, and uh, Steve Gottwald was the chair, Representative Loeffler and I used to sit over in this area, and he used to get us confused all the time. <laughs> I guess we look kind of alike. I guess we maybe talked a little bit alike. I don't know. She certainly knew a whole lot more than I did. But uh, we would sometimes tease him by switching our nameplates. <laughs> so I just wanted to share that memory with you and to kind of uh, end on a little bit of a high note, but we, we certainly will miss her today and, and every day going forward. So thank you very much, members. And I got through that without crying, so that's, <laughs> that's a good start. All right, so we're going to turn now to the main um, purpose for which we are here today, and that is to hear from DHS Commissioner Jody Harpstead. Um, if you'd like to come up to the table, Commissioner, and um, I don't know if other, I'm sure you have other staff in the room for questions later on, but uh, if you just be up at the table, very good. So I just want to start by saying, introducing this topic to us, we all know that DHS has enormous human impact in this state. Um, we just talked about Representative Loeffler. She knew that as well as anyone. She was constantly reminding us about the human lives that are touched by this agency. The agency deals with many thousands of elderly people, people with disabilities. Um, along with Minnesota's counties and Indian tribes, DHS provides support for families struggling with poverty care for children who are abused and neglected, and treatment for people with mental illnesses, including, as we know, substance abuse disorders. Over a million Minnesotans get their health care through public programs, and all of that is managed at least partially by DHS. Of course, this also means that DHS manages a lot of taxpayer money, both state and federal, and it also impacts county resources. Back in 2017, President Trump was talking about health care, and he said, it's an unbelievably complex subject. Nobody knew health care could be so complicated. Well, DHS knows how complicated it is, and so does this committee, and so did Diane Loeffler. And health care is only one of the complicated things that DHS manages. And that may be why the job of commissioner has the reputation as the most difficult job in state government. Since the end of the last legislative session, DHS has been in the news even more than usual. Commissioner Lori resigned, and there have been other resignations as well. And Governor Walz appointed an interim commissioner while searching for a replacement. And on September 3rd, Jody Harpstead became the commissioner of DHS. I am really grateful for her willingness to take the job. Um, let's see, excuse me. I'm still under the influence of our previous uh, discussion. Thank you. <laughs> Anyone else need a Kleenex? Here they are. Um, 
anyway. Um, Commissioner Harpstead took over, as we know, at a very difficult time for the agency. As everyone knows, in the past several months, there have been some high-profile instances of overpayments and problems revealed by the media, the legislative auditor, and by Commissioner Harpstead herself. Commissioner Harpstead comes from a different mold than previous DHS commissioners. She comes from the private sector as an outsider to DHS, and she may be the first DHS commissioner with a business background and likely is the first DHS commissioner with experience managing large organizations. I mean, think about that for a second. You know, we've had commissioners, as I think about them, most of them that I remember were attorneys. She comes from managing large organizations. Before her appointment, she spent eight years as president and CEO of Lutheran Social Services of Minnesota. Before that, she was executive vice president and chief operating officer for Lutheran Social Services. And before that, she spent 23 years in a variety of, of uh, positions with Medtronic. Her bachelor's degree is in business administration, and she holds an MBA with a concentration in finance. She started immediately to investigate her new agency, to find out what condition it's in, and to use her background and experience to recommend improvements and lead. Today is Commissioner Harpstead's 91st day on the job, if I did my counting correctly, and this hearing is the legislature's first opportunity to hear her report on what she's found and her plans for the agency. After she finishes her report, there'll be an opportunity for members of this committee to ask questions. Welcome to the committee, Commissioner Harpstead. Thank you, and first, blessings to all of you on the loss of your colleague. Chair Liebling, committee members, my name is Jody Harpstead. I've been serving as the Commissioner of the Minnesota Department of Human Services for the past 90 days. Thank you very much for this opportunity to present to you my 90-day report, which is the bookend to my 90-day plan, which I presented on my second day in the job. <laughs> Elements of that 90-day plan were getting to the bottom of reported payment issues that we had read about, filling open positions and building a new team, building relationships with constituents, listening and communicating with transparency, and continuing to drive the innovation in the department that has brought healthcare contract savings to Minnesota. I've said this over and over in my 90 days, there's nothing more important for the Minnesota Department of Human Services than to be trustworthy for the people of Minnesota. The over one million people we support to live in community and all taxpayers, period. When I got to the department, I discovered this mission, vision, and values statement. Our mission, the Department of Human Services, working with many others, helps people meet their basic needs so they can live in dignity and achieve their highest potential. And our vision is that when we help each other, we create a brighter future for Minnesota. I'll let you read the values. My observations from traveling the state and meeting people that work in and for and in partnership with the department, I had the opportunity to visit our community behavioral health hospital in Baxter, where many people have served for decades in those positions there, treating people and working with people in, uh, with serious mental illness. If there was ever a place in the state where you might expect to occasionally need restraint, it might be in this place. And they did show me a dark, quiet room with a chair with restraints in case they needed it. And the staff told me they hadn't used it in two years. I have always been in awe of social workers and people in social service who can de-escalate behavior without restraint. But I was in incredible awe of the people in that hospital and how they were able to do their jobs the way they did. And by the way, I think they have the hardest jobs in state government. A couple of weeks ago, I had the honor of visiting the Indian Health Board in South Minneapolis, where they've integrated not only community service and healthcare in a really innovative and groundbreaking way, but they're adding cultural work and cultural experience to that as well, and learning a lot and collecting data about the value of cultural experience in healthcare. I've discovered that we're now going to be able to offer new housing benefits through Medicaid to people with disabilities, I also visited the Wilder CCBHC, 
work in St. Paul where they are also integrating community services and health care in a very um, neighborhood grounded and uh, cultural, cultural approach. I've continued the conversation I started before I came to the department about the African American family preservation work and we're excited about the community conversations we have had and will continue to have and we hope to bring some additional uh, legislation forward in this next session to move family preservation forward. I went up to give an award of excellence to the Leech Lake Band of Ojibwe in their SNAP Ed program where they use um, the SNAP benefit to remind people of their benefits and also to teach children and their families how to shop for, cook, and eat healthy food. And we're all excited about the historic one-time increase in the MFIT benefit, which will allow people uh, living at the margins a better chance to get a foothold in our community. The reason I came to the Department of Human Services was to stand for better health, fuller life, and lower cost for all Minnesotans in that order. Also to see what I could do from this position to move the needle on equity, especially racial equity. And of course, getting the department's processes and systems humming like a Swiss watch so our good people can focus on fulfilling their mission. What I found, the same quality, caring, and competent people that I worked with in the Minnesota nonprofit sector. In a department of some 7,300 employees, 7,200 plus have simply continued to do their good work throughout 2019. Most of the DHS team would say they came to DHS to support their neighbors in living full lives, not to dot the I's and cross the T's. And some of the people at DHS love to dot I's and cross T's and are very good at it. They came to do that work at DHS to support their neighbors in achieving their highest potential. We have a high capacity department that I would describe now as soft around the edges. We need to sharpen soft interdepartmental process controls to be sure that service payment decisions are signed and documented by the right people. It's my belief after 90 days that the Minnesota Department of Human Services has always operated this way. We've been addressing some issues that go back 10 to 20 years. Governor Walls hired me to clean this up and move forward with processes we can all count on. And I'd like to just reiterate, soft interdepartmental process control, soft, not zero. Interdepartmental, so we have some very good people who know their stuff in each of our administrations. They need to work on their interdepartmental communication. And process controls, not financial controls. So as we've made decisions in the past on how things should be paid for, we need to get that right. But we pass our financial audits and follow generally accepted accounting principles. So it's not a question of financial controls as much as it is process controls. And DHS hired or trained their first Lean Six Sigma quality control green and black belts, a proven approach to tight controls in 2011. Examples of their track record, turning around direct care and treatment of our own services. I know you all remember headlines from three years ago about St. Peter Hospital and the Anoka Regional Treatment Center. And that place now is humming like a Swiss watch. The child care investigation process, many of you have seen the charts of before and after that process has been clarified and simplified. The vulnerable adult process at the Office of Health Facility Complaints. And Governor Wells likes to say, no one reports when the planes are all landing properly and on time. Um, you haven't heard in the paper about our current MinCare re-enrollment process, which is going on as we speak because it's going as smooth as silk. These are the issues that have been raised in 2019 in terms of payments from the Department of Human Services. You've all uh, heard of these before, over payments to tribal MAT, the settle up of IMD over payments, the deceased beneficiaries questions, Minnesota care premium refunds, cash assistance over recovery, 16 A and C reports, and Title IV e-funds. I want you to notice on the right hand side that the first two issues were reported by the press in 2019 and I have reported them myself to legislative leaders and the press since I came into my position. 
Commissioner, excuse me for one second. I think some people might be having a little trouble hearing. Do I need to if sit closer? If you could sit closer to the mic, and then we're going to turn up the volume just a bit as well. Thank you. Thanks for telling me about that. Oh, Whoa, that's no. much better, isn't it? Thank you. Thank you. Anyway, do you want to just, maybe do you want to just repeat the last sentence or something? Sure. I just wanted you to notice the right-hand column that the first couple of issues were issued in the press in 2019. And mm -hmm. since I came on board, I have, I have called legislative leaders and the press myself on all the issues on the list. All told, they add up to $106.5 million in payment errors. Sunlight is always the best disinfectant. I want to thank every employee, manager, and auditor who found these issues. Each one is a trail marker pointing to another process control step that will prevent future problems. We will not suppress or retaliate against anyone inside DHS who comes forward pointing to problems, and we intend to have a culture where people feel encouraged to surface problems. I've been calling legislative leaders and the press myself to model DHS behavior of ownership and accountability for problems. Every dime matters. We've reported inappropriate payments this year. The decisions made by the Department of Human Services over many years that led to these inappropriate payments were not trustworthy decisions. I am deeply sorry to our community partners such as tribes and counties as well as individual Minnesotans who have been affected by these decisions. DHS on the other hand is not in a free fall in crisis, in total chaos. If you look at the totals from issues reported in 2019 from the previous graph or table, they reached $106.5 million over six years. Over the same six years, total DHS payments were $96.1 billion. And so these errors represent 0.1%, one-tenth of 1% of our total payments. And we're going after the 0.1% because every dime matters. Around the middle of the quarter, I said to my staff, I'm looking at these complex billing systems between CMS and DHS, and I can imagine the accounting um, entries that go back and forth between them all the time. Does the federal government ever pay us back? As a matter of fact, yes. These recent errors for which DHS has had to pay the federal government are the $103.3 million of the previous slide. And recent items for which the federal government has had to repay DHS, $94 million. You may remember the multi-year cleanup of the Sears system, Surveillance and Integrity Review System. It's how we catch provider fraud. We overpaid our portion of that and got it back. And the settlement of the BHP lawsuit, $84 million, a dispute over the market rate insurance rates that were to be used for setting our MinCare rates, um, and the settlement of that suit brought in $84 million. So $94 million coming back from CMS to DHS. I've mentioned before DHS's Operation Swiss Watch, which kicks off tomorrow. We have a group of people in our department who know how to do process improvement. They're getting to the root cause of each of the issues that have been surfaced in recent years, understanding to connect the dots between them, find the patterns, and see what kinds of controls we need to put in place to prevent them going forward. But our team didn't leave it at that. I didn't even ask them to, but our compliance department uh, head and our um, process control department head got together and put in operation stopgap, which means it's in place now. And if there's a new payment decision to be made, it requires uh, two to three signatures before it can be put into operation. And so starting now, decisions need the proper signatures before payments can be made. We also have an RFP out now to bring in an outside process control expert to look at all these things that we're doing to see if we're missing anything. And we intend to add additional experts to the department. 
We're also centralizing our financial controls. In October 2019, the Procurement Division of DHS moved under the CFO. This area facilitates over $650 million in spending and manages over $500 million in assets. And in October of 2019, the financial team within the Healthcare Administration of DHS, our largest business area, was restructured to consolidate the financial responsibilities into one position, which now also reports up through our CFO. Our financial operations division is also proposing additional resources, but it is one that already hums like a Swiss watch. Our compliance department has begun a process of long-term risk assessment. In initial conversations, they've uncovered what people believe are two of our biggest long-term risks. This won't surprise you, needed systems upgrades and updated process and procedure manuals so that every employee knows the rules. Representative Liebling asked me to come today with what can the legislature do? One would be to support additional green and black belts for the department, compliance, financial control experts, and IT systems. Another is to consider some of our proposed legislation going forward to ensure federal compliance and program integrity. I saw a list of potential bills this year and a couple of uh, groups of them had these titles, federal compliance and program integrity. And I'm told that some of them have been presented for the last several years and never passed uh, during the session. So I'm asking for help with uh, helping us with the unexciting work of good government processes. These bills are not flashy, they don't make headlines, but they help us to really make sure that our processes are in, in control and that people can count on the work. I've also just begun to get uh, some picture of asking you to help us factor process integrity into legislation. We've talked to a lot of Minnesotans who would like to see us deregulate childcare to make it more available, especially in rural Minnesota. And people are looking for deregulation of PCA work so that um, we can make that more available across the state. And then we're gonna have a conversation about tight controls over those services. So it's a worthy conversation and I look forward to having them with you as we discuss how to make regulation not stand in the way of good services, but still have controls around it uh, so people can count on it. I noted to Representative Liebling in a recent conversation that everything starts on July 1st. <laughs> and I noticed, uh, looking at our history, that our 16A forms uh, pile up around July 1st. So when the legislature uh, passes bills to help people get new services that make a lot of sense for people across the state, they hand them to the Department of Human Services and we scramble to get everything stood up on July 1st. It might be useful to have some things start in August or September so that we have the time to get things set up well, properly, and uh, according to the rules. And then in general, time to stand up new services and payments. These things do take time to make sure they're done well. They're gonna take a bit longer in the future as we make sure everything is signed off before we're able to start making payments. And it takes time to get things set up well. I was in one conversation uh, this last quarter where someone suggested, you know, this is really urgent. Let's just get this set up and going fast, if, even if it's not perfect. That's not what I'm hearing <laughs> from Minnesota in the last, uh, 90 days, we need to find ways to stand things up as quickly as possible, but with good process so that we can all count on them. Team DHS, uh, putting together uh, a team here of people that are a good combination of people who have been in the department for many, many years, people who've been with us for a few, and some fresh faces with some fresh ideas. Uh, first of all, we've cast a wide net looking for leadership talent and diversity. We've added three positions and eliminated three off the org chart. At least three of our nine open positions will be filled with people of color. And I want you to notice on your org chart, I believe you have an org chart in front of you that's easier to read than, this, than the slide was. First of all, uh, sort of four, four circles of people. If you look straight down from my name, you'll see the four assistant commissioners of our various administrations for people with disabilities, older adults, children and families, and our healthcare administration. And those assistant commissioners will all report to me now. If you look to the left, you will see uh, Deputy Commissioner Chuck Johnson, and I'm going to take just a moment to say to you that I could not have gotten through the last 90 days without Deputy Commissioner Chuck Johnson. 
He's been around for years. He knows everyone. He knows where things are. He knows how things work. And I could not have gotten through this last 90 days without his amazing institutional knowledge and his um, real integrity around how he does his work. He's also uh, the one who brought um, process control to the Department of Human Services, and he has the internal control functions under him that will turn around these payment issues. And so you can see on the org chart, we've got, he has the CFO, the compliance officer, the IT department, and then the uh, continuous process improvement group as well. Another circle is um, to the right of the center, and that is that I have a, I'm adding a new position of Deputy Commissioner for Communications and Relations. It's very clear to me, as large as the department is, and as much taxpayer money as we use, that we need to be in constant listening and communicating mode. And I need to bring our communications people, our legislative people, our county relations people, our tribal relations people, all together in one group to be doing plenty of listening to Minnesotans and then plenty of transparent communicating. And finally, the equity circle. There's a, uh, we're adding a uh, chief equity officer reporting directly to me. We have equity coordinators in various parts of the department that have done some really marvelous work, but we have not had an agency-wide plan for helping us to examine our own implicit bias and then examining the services we provide uh, through an equity lens. And so I'm adding a chief equity officer reporting directly to me to coordinate and organize that activity. This structure reflects our commitments to better health, fuller life, lower cost, equity, and process control. I've asked the senior leaders in the Department of Human Services to imagine their biggest possibilities. This is a tool that I've used in other organizations where I've worked. I've asked them to look out three years and imagine all the scenarios about that thing they would most like to accomplish, and then tell me, what is the biggest possibility of your area? Marshall Smith and our direct care and treatment group, I mentioned before, you read about them in the headlines three years ago with the problems they were having. And now they're humming like a Swiss watch. His group, three years out, is imagining achieving, achieving the readiness criteria for the National Malcolm Baldridge Quality Award. He tells me if they actually got that award, it would be the first department of a state government winning the Malcolm Baldridge Award. Lisa Bailey in Children and Family Services wants to capture and organize the statewide commitment to a big picture reform of our child welfare system. And Tom Moss, our Interim Healthcare Administration, AC, wants to establish the Integrated Health Partnership 2.0 program. And I have said so far that my biggest possibility in three years is that 50% of the senior managers in the department will achieve their biggest possibilities. We're also working uh, to build a better employee culture inside the department and supporting our employees. The first step is a strong management team. The second is that we're working to craft an employee vision statement. We have vision statements for the people we support in community. And we'd like to have one for what it is our intention for the people who work in the department. Last week, many of our leaders went to a collaborative safety model training. Collaborative safety model is an approach to tackling problems without tackling each other. It's a way to be respectful of each other as we look at difficult problems. And our mantra has become that we're intending to be tough on process and supportive, encouraging to our people. Relationships, relationships, relationships. I've mentioned the Deputy Commissioner for Community and Relationships. We're also rebuilding a county tribal advisory board that used to be in place at DHS. Actually, it was a county advisory board. We tried to do that again, and the county people said, let's add the tribes. So we're talking about both. Serving over a million Minnesotans and spending billions in taxpayer money, we have a particular obligation to excel at listening and communicating. And we're working to develop new flexibility around discussing issues with key partners instead of surprising them with new information. We've been around the table twice now talking to our county partners about how we're going to deal together with the recent issues that have been uncovered. Innovation was the fourth part of my 90-day plan. Better health, fuller lives, lower costs in that order. Minnesota, I, su I assume you know, is already a national leader in several new health care models, the Integrated Health Partnerships, Accountable Care Organizations, the incorporation of social determinants of health, which most people are still just talking about, Minnesota is starting to include in health care. The certified community behavioral health clinics that I mentioned earlier, an extraordinary new model, and two-generation supports to approaching 
people living in poverty. One result is our average managed care capitation rates increased 8.3% per year from 2000 to 2010, and they have decreased 5.7% per year from 2011 to 2016. We have a new plan for our procurements. You may remember that I canceled a major procurement in the first hour of my new job. And we've decided to do no Medicaid healthcare contracting in 2020. All the current contracts will stay in place with no disruption of coverage. Consumers of healthcare currently have good access and plans have good rates. This will give us a chance to discuss what Minnesotans really want in terms of these kinds of health care contracts. It will give our new assistant commissioner for health care and our new state Medicaid director a chance to get their feet under them. And it will give DHS a chance to launch our new process control effort as we head toward our next procurement. So the new plan is that rural children and family health care, the one that we just canceled, will be an RFP in 21 and start in 22. That senior and coordination services will be an RFP in 21 also to start in 22 and that Metro Children and Family Health Care will be an RFP in 22 to start in 23. As I think back on my 90 days, I've thought about the lessons from 2019. What will they say about all of us years from now when they look back at 2019? Just a reminder, most of the payment issues we are addressing now did not happen in 2019. They went viral in 2019. And we've put stop gaps in place before the end of 2019. The confluence of the DHS resignations and media coverage of tribal overpayments this summer kicked off a frenzy that has led to a view of DHS as a department in serious disarray. The resulting outcry has caused pressure on employee relationships in the department, making it harder to get the good work done, not to mention our biggest possibilities. Democracy isn't easy. When we run billions of dollars of taxpayer money and every Minnesotan has an opinion about how that should be spent, we quickly become the department everyone loves to criticize. Fair enough, we can live with that. I would ask Minnesotans to take a look at the department's overall results, read the stories of the lives supported with their taxpayer dollars through DHS's work, and make a fair judgment of the total picture. I took a tour last week of the Catholic Charity St. Paul Opportunity Center on Dorothy Day Place, right around the corner from my office, and listened to the need for additional emergency housing support for our neighbors lacking shelter. As new DHS internal control measures go into effect and new leaders come on board, I intend to spend more of my time and energy on what I came to DHS to do, better health, fuller lives, and lower cost for all Minnesotans, and moving the needle on racial equity. What about breaking up the department? The governor and I have been talking throughout my first 90 days about how the department should be structured and whether restructuring the department would improve efficiency, accountability, and the delivery of services. The governor will be making an announcement in the coming days on this matter. We are also putting together the DHS Commissioner's Advisory Panel for 2020. Its charge is to review our progress and advise me on restoring the trustworthiness of the department, including those process controls, our organization structure, management, team development, and our department culture. <clears throat> I'm pleased to say that Bill George, the former CEO and chair of Medtronic, has agreed to co-chair this advisory panel, and we are getting close to an announcement of a second co-chair. Um, the members, I'm really pleased to say, include the four legislative chairs of the Health and Human Services Committees of the legislature here and two or three other community leaders to round out the panel. I am proud to be the commissioner of the Department of Human Services. The people of the department came to DHS to support their neighbors in living in community and achieving their highest potential. We are attracting strong candidates for our open positions who are honored to be asked to join us. I ask for your support as we work to strengthen our process controls, build a strong team with new members, strengthen our relationships with partners and community, and continue our innovation in health and human service delivery. I'm also proud to be a Minnesotan, have been for 40 years now. In every sector in which I've worked, we all come home from national conferences thrilled to be working in Minnesota. I have learned that Minnesotans uniquely believe we have an obligation to care for our neighbors, and if we apply ourselves, we can make things right. Minnesotans love and excel at the art of democracy, so bring on the conversation.
And finally, there is nothing more important for the Minnesota Department of Human Services than to be trustworthy for the people of Minnesota, the over 1 million people we support to live in community, and all taxpayers, period. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much, Commissioner. We really uh, appreciate that. There's a lot that you cover, a lot. And um, I know you and I have had a lot of conversations over the past 90 days, as, is, uh, as you've mentioned in here, you, you, you call legislative leaders a lot. Um, and I have to say that over my time in the legislature, I have gotten a lot of those calls from commissioners of DHS, even when I was not the chair of this committee. And um, I always sort of dreaded them because it usually meant that something was going wrong. <laughs> you know, this is a very large department. It does a lot of very complex work. And I, uh, you know, I appreciate your, your noting that the problems didn't occur this year. There have been problems, of course, over the years. And with an a agency of this complexity, with the ever-changing rules, landscape, federal rules, um, Things are always changing. It would be amazing to me to never get one of those calls. I would really wonder what was going on. But I have really appreciated your openness. And I know that you've also been available to any other member who has wanted to. I don't know how many of those meetings you've actually had. But have you been available to any member who wanted to come and ask you questions? Have you come and visit, talk to you about particular concerns? So. I just want to lay that out there. It's not as though we've had 90 days of a black box. We've had 90 days of your availability. And frankly, I kind of even wonder how you manage it all. It's been a full 90 days. Yeah, I imagine. You no vacations in that 90 days, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> I know, maybe you had Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. I don't know. But anyway, um, so we have a number of members with questions uh, that are on the list. and. Um, I'm going to start with, well, let me just tell you who's on the list, members, so you can get a sense of where you are here. So we have Cantrell, Bierman, Grunhagen, Munson, Schultz, Zerwas, Haley, Schumacher, Baker, Franson, and I'm sure we'll add others. So um, Representative Cantrell, we're starting with you. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Commissioner Harpstead. Um, so all of us in this committee, and, and I'm sure you do as well, care greatly about uh, all the Minnesotans who are served by the Department of Human Services, many of whom are the most vulnerable among us. Uh, and, and the department really offers um, a, a lifeline to, uh, to folks who are living with disabilities to the nearly 4,000 children who live in Scott or Dakota County who benefit from the child care assistance program who otherwise would not be able to receive these essential early childhood development, early child care um, resources. Um, and I think it goes without saying um, that we equally care about making sure that um, every single taxpayer dollar is being used uh, effectively, efficiently, and is being used appropriately. Um, so Commissioner, my, my question for you is given your experience managing a large organization, can you outline your perspective on potentially restructuring uh, the, different, uh, the department in such a way that would further compartmentalize uh, the different operations of the department? Um, and would you, uh, in your opinion, would you say that a decentralization of the different operations of the Department of Human Services um, is an, a, an effective or efficacious way to prevent further misallocation of funds? Um, in your opinion. Do you mean within the department or do you mean talking about breaking up the department? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Commissioner Cantrell. Harpstead. Sorry. Um, <clears throat> uh, I'm referring to, um, in, from what you've observed in the past 90 days uh, that, that you've been Commissioner of the Department of Human Services, um, is it your assessment that a decentralization of the different operations of, of the different services the department administers, do you think that a, a decentralization of those processes would result in uh, a, a preventing misallocation of funds in the future? Um, or do you think that, that there are certain benefits to a centralized, I, I'm, I'm trying to, I guess, ascertain what you've observed on that and kind of what your perspective is moving forward. Thank you, sure. Chair Liebling and Representative Bierman. Um, Cantrell. Cantrell, I'm sorry, looking at the wrong <laughs> plaque here, sorry. It's hard to see your name yeah. plaques. <laughs> um, I have uh, several thoughts about the possibility of, of um, decentralizing or splitting the department. I've been open to the conversation, has, as has the governor, in terms of um, whether or not that would make a difference. Um, a couple things, I several things I'd be concerned about if we were to look at that. One is, it's my experience that when you split departments and people over time, 
not in a planful way, but just because it happens over time, add infrastructure, you end up with two more costly departments than the one original department. Does that make sense? It just tends to happen when you split departments. Um, so I'd be concerned about the cost to Minnesota of having them separate. Um, another thing is that as we put together centralized controls, process controls across all of our administrations, if you were then to split them up, you'd have to recreate those process controls in other places. Mm -hmm. And um, the thought of a centralized process control is, is the reason that we put those in place. We've also centralized our control functions, as you've heard me say, in our compliance department and our finance department. And if, if then departments were split after that, those would all have to be replicated. I mean, we could split ours into different departments, but then everybody would have to recreate the work. Um, I have heard um, serious concern from counties about splitting the Department of Human Services because they think of themselves managing integrated services and if they had to go to three different departments in, of, in the state department or the state government to work with uh, people, that would be uh, a lot harder. And uh, we would have to try even harder to communicate with each other across commissioners than we do today. Um, the one area that's made some sense to me as I've thought about it in 90 days uh, to potentially split is our direct care and treatment, which is a very different kind of service than the administrations that contract with others to provide service. Um, and so it might be the, the cleanest separation if you think about it that way. Um, there have been concerns raised over many years about the fact that the Office of Inspector General inspects our own services and is that a conflict of interest? I don't know that it's caused any problems, but it's a question that, raised, that gets raised. So, so those are some initial thoughts about it. Um, and, and then I'd be completely open to an examination of it and a further conversation to see if I'm missing something and if there's something that would make everything easier to manage if it was separated. Does that answer your question? Thank you. Representative yes, Commissioner. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Cantrell. Uh, next is Representative Bierman. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Commissioner Harpstead, for joining us today. We've uh, been waiting for this day after your first 90 days to get a good overview and uh, appreciate your you know, broad brush jokes about what's going on with the department, but I also appreciate the fact that you've been getting out to places like the CCBHC clinics, which I have some some familiarity with as well, and, and um, thanks for mentioning how hard those people do work. When you go out to sites and you see the work that is occurring out there, it's, it's an eye-opener, and it makes everything we talk about in this room really real. I wanted to go to the one of the early issues mentioned in the uh, list of DHS uh, hot topics right now, which is the CC, the Child Care uh, Assistance Program. Go back to that. <laughs> child Care Assistance is something that I see uh, th such a great need for in my district and in my county and in urban, rural, it doesn't matter. I met with some farming organizations recently and ch affordable child care is in their top three. So this is a huge issue, and there's not a rep sitting at this table that doesn't have hundreds of children in their districts that, at least hundreds, some, some thousands. So this program is integral. And like you mentioned, some of the problems go back a few years. In 2019, this House body had some good uh, innovations to that through legislation to help ensure that licenses were better, enforcement, uh, communication between state and county, and uh, there were a number of, of things which I don't know if you've had the full time to look over, but I am wondering whether all of those things the legislature did last time, whether in your opinion you know whether it's enough or whether there, we need to do more, because you know everybody is concerned about the dollars, and I'm glad you started your presentation with talking about that fact. Yep. It's it's about money. It's about better health, but it's also about the economy of getting our dollars worth. So I would be interested in anything you have to say today on that topic or in the future, and uh, appreciate your time. Sure, Commissioner. Yes, Chair Liebling and Representative Bierman. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, I, I just want to go back to. Um, my slide what the legislature can do and on the list was potential bills um, that we need to pass to have federal compliance and child care is on that list uh, there's a there's a minimum rate payment for 
childcare through the federal government that we aren't at yet. And so um, that's an issue for us and we should go back and take a look at all that and I need to understand it a lot better, but I know it's on that list of things that need to um, happen for us to be in complete federal compliance with that service. Um, I will also share that in my travels and visiting and, and in my previous work at Lutheran Social Service, um, the glaring issue of workforce shortage is everywhere and it's in all of our services and it's especially in the caring services, child care, elder care, nursing home, um, group homes for people with developmental disabilities. And so I, we have some real problems to solve going forward in terms of how we're going to care for people who need support, um, direct support um, in the decades ahead with the aging baby boom and all. Um, and figure out how to fund that. I'm, I'm optimistic about a few things like Uber and grocery delivery and some of the technical things that are happening around us that are starting to make it a little easier for people uh, to live on their own or at home or in families um, and not on congregate care sites, but um, still a lot to tackle. And, and as this baby boom ages and people retire and we need to replace them, these positions are tough to fill. I take the childcare issues uh, very personally. My daughter's unable to find afford affordable, available childcare in the state of New York. And I appreciate what, uh, what she's been through to try to find uh, what she needs there. So we have a lot to talk about and some really serious problems to solve in terms of making the numbers work as people retire from positions and we don't have enough people filling them, especially in the caring professions. Mm -hmm. Representative Bierman, follow up. Uh, I'll just, I'll leave it at that for now. I just do want to thank you for being here today and thank you for having an open door because all the work we do, even when laws are passed, it's not the end all. So it's still a beginning the next year or as we see how systems play out. So I just want to make sure as we address this issue going forward, if there are things we need to do, we'd like to have that conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Bierman. Representative Grunhagen. Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, first, uh, Commissioner Harpstead, thanks for taking this job on, okay? I know it's not easy. The other thing is I agree with you that your department serves our most vulnerable, and uh, that's a very important, not critical issue for our state. Of course, you have one of the largest budgets in, this, in our state. But I do have a uh, question here. You know, by my count, according to your presentation, you said there was about 106 million. Well, according to our staff, we see about 160 million that has been uh, misappropriated uh, through, through whatever means. But this, this summer and fall in fraud or mismanagement. The other thing I just want to add, I, you're, a, you know, this happened long before you. According to the information I have, and the federal audits of compliance, this started back in 2004, okay? So you're kind of hopping uh, in mid or late stream as far as this issue is concerned. Um, however, you're now, in, you're now uh, the responsible commissioner, and when there are this many issues handling of, the, of the handling of money you already receive and managing these programs, already under the DHS watch. How can we trust DHS with any new money or programs until we see fundamental uh, reform and change? Mm -hmm. and, follow comment. All right, and you know, uh, so uh, a few issues there that commissioner that you're being asked to respond to. One is that there's a different figure and I don't know, Representative Grunhagen, you said staff gave you that. Are you talking about? Yeah. What staff are you talking about? So just to give her a point of reference? Partisan staff, 160 million. Okay, and then um, and in that question was, a, I would say, a, a statement that this was money that was misappropriated and you mentioned fraud or mismanagement. And so, Commissioner, as you answer the question, could you kind of frame it for us about, you know, what are we talking about? Are we talking about money that went out the door in fraud or exactly what are we talking about here, Commissioner? 
Thank you, Chair Liebling and uh, Representative Grunhagen. Um, this is the list that we have been uh, reporting on throughout 2019. I appreciate there are other lists, and we've seen other lists and people with suggestions on what should be on this list. None of this list represented fraud by the Department of Human Services. It was all errors that were made in payment decisions. And I just want to go back to this slide. Um, we could debate the list, like what is on the list, what was the whole list. Um, if we went with the number that you just mentioned, we would still be at 0.2% of total payments at the Department of Human Services. So I, I appreciate people have different thoughts about what should and shouldn't be on a list. Um, but it would take 960 million to get to 1% of, of our total uh, payments, and again, Every dime matters, so even with this and with whatever else you just mentioned, we would want to work to get to the bottom of issues. I'd love to see what else is on that list and uh, see what we're doing about that uh, to get back to work here. Um, in terms of trusting the Department of Human Services, I think the best uh, way to think about that is to go to the place where we have um, right here, uh, brought in our quality control processes. Um, direct care and treatment in the blazing headlines three years ago, quiet now, three years later, actually quiet a couple of years later. Um, the uh, other issues on this list have been settled fairly quickly after we applied these kinds of techniques to them. Um, we also worked closely with, um, for example, Minsher. That was in the headlines four years ago, and some of our staff worked with them. Um, and, and now that's uh, going very well in their open enrollment process. And so we've just had a track record of being able to turn things around using these process controls. And I fully expect to do the same with our payment systems, but you'll only know that when we show that to you. And as we go forward, we'll have to demonstrate that, that reliability. Madam Chair, I got a clarification on that. Thing. Representative Grunhey. Uh The 160 million includes grants and contracts without proper <coughs> documentation of about 52 million, just for your information. And maybe, uh, maybe you can check that out. That's according oh, to my okay. staff. Just one other comment. <laughs> you know, my understanding is that there's been over 200 contract laws broken by DHS going back to 2004. You know, I come from the private sector, I'm a private businessman, and if there was a private company that broke 200 contract laws in this state, I think they'd be closed down by the state, they'd be fined, and the CEOs would probably be put in jail. And so to me, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. I think we need to empower someone in state government to impose fines and consequences for mismanagement of taxpayer money. And, uh, you know, whether it's uh, Attorney General or the Office of Legislative Auditor. But if we don't, my concern and understanding of human nature is, in a few years, we'll be right back in this situation with mismanaged money unless you have some type of a strong consequence, like the state takes with the private sector. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner, did you want to respond? Yes, uh, Chair Liebling and, and Representative Grunhagen. Um, I appreciate now, I think you're talking about the 16A forms that were a subject of a hearing earlier this quarter. If you look at them on the chart here, there was zero overspending or refunded money. I just want to be clear about that. Um, the 16A form is one that uh, when a, a provider gets started, jumps the gun before a contract is signed. There is a provision in uh, our process in state government to, uh, once the contract is signed, to go back and pay that provider to day one of service. Um, and as I mentioned, ours tend to pile up around July 1st when so many services get started. This past year, those kinds of forms were signed for um, women's recovery services and emergency housing services. Um, I have... Um, been examining that and fascinated by a process that provides a bit of grace for an organization, especially a small organization, that jumps the gun on starting work. And this process allows us to pay them back to the first day of service. But when it's signed, it puts us in the headlines for breaking the law. But the form is part of state government process. So I've been a little bewildered about how that whole process works. Um, 
but once that form is signed, um, no one got paid a dime until the contract was signed. So we had signed contracts before any dollars moved, and so there was a zero, I have it a zero on this chart in terms of dollars, um, but we have used those 16A forms over the years, especially to make government a little easier to work with, especially for small providers. Our CFO took a hold of the 16A process a couple of years ago and insisted that she see every one of those in her office. And she's also been doing training and working with the staff to explain that we want to stop using this form as often as we can and to eliminate or, or reduce its usage. And so um, that's what I know about that process. And Commissioner, if I could just ask, the 16A, that term, does that refers to actually a section of statute that permits this process, am I right? Right. Yeah, okay. All right, um, Representative Munson. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you, Commissioner Harpstead, for coming today to testify. Um, I know it's, uh, we've been anxious to hear from you on your first 90 days. Um, it is an interesting presentation. I think notably absent from the presentation was uh, really addressing the CCAP. I know that didn't come up this year. It shouldn't be on the list. There are things that were discovered this year. It was discovered last year. Um, but we had a very extensive report from the, from the Office of Legislative Auditor uh, that talked about all the fraud in child care. Um, and specifically, uh, this 13-page letter from, the, from Jay Swanson, who's the manager of DHS recipient and child care provider investigation, um, and in his letter, he talks about how there was, uh, you know, 50% of uh, suspected fraud within this program that was uh, $217 million in 2017. Um, I know that your, your plan is to get your department running like a Swiss watch, but in choosing, you know, uh, something to model it after you, choosing a 500-year-old invention that itself loses three minutes every month on, on Swiss watches, I mean, in... If, if we didn't make driving with a smartwatch illegal this year, it'd be nice to say Operation Smartwatch, because we should be doing something that is, that is, that is going after something so accurate. Um, so I, I think that uh, there's, there's no acceptable fraud or level of fraud uh, that's okay for me, um, and I, I hope we can go after all the fraud, but the, the level of, of uh, child care fraud that came out in these reports, um, in the, the legislature didn't really do anything to address this fraud uh, through legislation this year, which was frustrating to me. But if we see $100 million in fraud over the past five years, that's a half billion dollars that we can add into that list of potential fraud. Um, there's, there's a federal requirement that, uh, that uh, the department visit every child care center in the state every year. Um, and I'm, I'm curious to know, in the first 90 days, have, has someone made an unannounced visit to uh, a fourth of the child care centers in the state uh, so we can start tackling these uh, the fraud within CCAP because even in this report they talk about child care centers being shut down because they were fraudulent and then another center opens up in the same location uh, the next month and, and that's frustrating for for my constituents that call me and, and ask me continually continuously about how we're addressing the child care fraud and I don't I didn't see anything in your report on how you're attacking that and uh just, you know, again, I, I think it's important to be accurate in our statements, and I, I, I'll just respond to the part where you said the legislature didn't do anything. In fact, we did a lot. We did quite a bit of what was in the HHS bill involved tightening up controls. There was a lot of time spent. Um, Representative Pinto, who's not on this committee, had the lead on that, but there were quite a number of provisions put in place. and. Um, so that's the legislative part. I just don't want to let that go unanswered. If your constituents are asking and you can't answer them, maybe you need to find out the information so you can tell them what the legislature did. Um, Madam Chair, this, this committee passed in, in our omnibus bill that was passed that I voted against. Um, they were lowering the, the, the fines, the penalties for you know, fraudulent, fraudulently accepting child care dollars to be an administrative penalty instead of a fine. So it, there, was, there was work done in this committee to go the wrong way. Um, I, I didn't see major improvements in the, in the, well, in the bill this year. Actually, but. Representative Munson, a lot of the work was done in the Child Care Committee, which was a separate subcommittee, so I don't know if you're on that one, but you would, probably wouldn't have been there for all of the hearings on that. But there were quite a few provisions. I'm not going to take the time right now to list them for you, but I'm sure the commissioner can, can respond to some of that. But just mm -hmm. if you say the legislature didn't do anything, that is patently false. Commissioner. 
Chair Liebling and Representative Munson, I am going to read this to you because I wasn't here back then. My understanding is the OLA report concluded that uh, they did not find evidence to substantiate the allegation that the level of CCAP fraud is 100 million annually. That was another number. There's lots of numbers. The OLA estimated the level of CCAP fraud is more than the five to six million that prosecu prosecutors have been able to prove, but did not offer a reliable estimate of how much actually exists. Um, and they were unable to substantiate any allegations of, of that money going to foreign countries, which was also part of reports um, back then. I don't know the current state of how often we visit every child care center in Minnesota, so I'll have to find that out and, and let you know. Um, okay, um, Representative Schultz. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I, I also want to thank you, Commissioner, for accepting this position and working extremely hard um, to figure out how to resolve some of the issues at DHS. Um, I also want to thank you for reaching out to Health and Human Services members uh, frequently to give us updates on, on your progress at the agency. Uh, you know, in my five years here at the legislature, I am so, I've been so impressed with the work of our agencies, particularly DHS and the Department of Health. And when I travel to conferences on health policy, I am frequently reminded how impressive our state is and how innovative and entrepreneurial and efficient um, our staff at the agencies and their work. Um, I'm reminded from other legislators and other policymakers in other states. At the same time, um, I believe, you know, that it's been difficult, I'm sure, to attract high quality individuals and retain them because in my view, my belief is that they're underpaid compared to their market salaries. Um, and they're doing this for other reasons. They're doing this to improve the lives of people in Minnesota. So I really wanna thank everyone working at our agencies and all the great work they're doing to improve the lives of people in Minnesota. Um, and so I think as legislators, we need to take a look at if we expect more oversight and accountability that we need to fund that. We need to fund investments in, in information technology so we can do better tracking. And I think part of this issue is that you know, we're to blame because we underfund it. And I also want to remind members that, you know, there's over $300 billion of waste, fraud, and abuse in the private for-profit sector in healthcare. And we need to look at um, all sectors, not just our state agencies, to recover some of that revenue so we can use that revenue to help people who are uninsured and don't have access to high quality health care. Um, the uh, services for people are really important. And I, I, I just have a few questions for you, Commissioner. First of all, uh, I don't see the Medicaid director on your org chart. And I'm just wondering if you can clarify where that position will be and what your idea is for the Medicaid director, who, the pers who that person will report to, um, and um, address any um, changes you, you hope to make. And then um, secondly, I also just wanna comment that having less than one-tenth of 1% 1 of payments that um, may have um, been um, problematic is very, very low. So if you could comment, compared to your experience in the private sector, um, how do we compare as a state agency to the private sector in terms of our efficiency, oversight, accountability, and mispayments? I know when I see recent reports of private health insurers who are getting fined millions of dollars um, because they're not paying for the appropriate care, especially in mental health, or getting fined for other reasons, that it's much, much larger in the private sector than our state agencies who are there to improve people's lives um, and not make a profit, do it. Um, at cost. So if you could just comment on the Medicaid director position and compared to the private sector, how efficient are we in, in level of oversight of our state agency? Uh, I'm sorry, the very, and the first question was? About the Medicaid director. Medicaid director, thank you, sorry. Um, so Chair Liebling and um, Representative Schultz, I've left the Medicaid director on the same place it was on the org chart before, reporting to the Assistant Commissioner for Healthcare Administration. Uh, that role plays an integral role in that administration and works uh, daily 
with the Assistant Commissioner of Healthcare Administration. Um, as we've said, we're putting together a process control process that would require anyone making a decision, for example, in the Children and Family Services on a payment that requires Medicaid approval would have to have the signature of the Medicaid director and the other department. Um, but um, the work of the Medicaid director is so integral with the healthcare administration uh, where we have our largest set of contracts and services that um, we want to leave it there. Um, we had, there was, uh, the last person that had that position had both titles, um, but with that person gone, um, who had had one title for years, then they added the second one. If we're bringing in two new people, I want them uh, working very closely together, learning from each other as they integrate themselves into our work. And so that's where we've left the um, Medicaid director. You raise a very fascinating question about um, payment issues in the private sector, and I don't know if studies have been done um, or if people have any information about that, <laughs> because of course the private sector handles these issues in private, and, <laughs> and, and we put them in the newspaper. And so it's really hard to compare and to know what uh, really goes on in uh, different private sector organizations. I can tell you that I worked for two stellar gold star uh, nonprofit and for-profit organizations and we weren't continually dealing with issues around payments um, and so I can't really compare to those two organizations and I don't know how it looks in others. I did want to mention something else though that you started with. You were talking about attracting great people um, to the department. Um, it's taken us a little longer than I had hoped to fill the positions in the department. Most of that has been because we've been dealing with this and uh, not spending as many hours as I would have liked filling positions. We also swung for the fences and we've had three people uh, who have said they couldn't join us. Uh, only one of them so far because of our state salary structure. Uh, but that was a problem uh, just last week. Other people just because of uh, particular lifestyle issues or where they are right now in their lives um, uh, didn't decide to take a step. I didn't point out, though, on our org chart that the one person that we are able to announce for a new position is our own Matt Burdick, our new permanent regular legislative director. <laughs> and excited to have him with us. He's been working with us on an interim basis over the last 90 days, and it was not a tough choice to fill that position. We have two other positions filled, but we haven't yet worked out a communications plan with the place they're coming from, and so we're not able to announce them uh, this morning. Thank you. Representative Schultz, follow up? No, thank you. All right. Uh, Representative Zerwas. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And, um, you know, I think I, I appreciate, uh, Commissioner, the idea that, you know, the $106 million, when compared to the overall size of, of the budget uh, for the department, um, let alone the state budget, we're talking about a, a small number in, in regards to the to the overall, and so you start talking about, well, it's just a percentage of this, or it's it's a, a tenth of percentage of that. But I think when we look at um, the overpayments uh, to the Native American tribes of around $29 million, in which those two tribes are on the hook for $29 million, um, two of the poorest tribes in the state, I, I think it's a little disconnect to tell us that the numbers are small uh, in the grand scheme and that a tenth of a percent, you know, is, is something that shouldn't, we shouldn't uh, overburden ourselves with being concerned about that because when it comes down to it, um, yeah, it's $29 million and, and the department's checking account, that's a, that's a blip on the screen, but when we come with our handout, uh, this spring uh, to those two tribes, they don't have the money. They don't have the money and they have no reasonable expectation that they will ever have the money to pay that. So um, I find it somewhat frustrating as someone that's been working in the space uh, around kind of uh, inappropriate expenses over the last several, uh, seven years where we get kind of the pushback has, has only been, well, um, it's a, it's a one-off uh, example. There isn't widespread uh, problems. It's this one program or it's that one program. Uh, several years back when the Office of Legislative Auditor 
did a report around uh, eligibility enrollment, <coughs> and those numbers extrapolated out to $300 million of people being enrolled in programs uh, uh, that didn't qualify for the base program that we were in, we were told for years, we were told for years that that was fake, that that, that, that loss was fake, that any potential savings uh, by, by relooking at enrollment eligibility was going to be fake. Those savings weren't going to be realized. Uh, the state implemented uh, periodic data matching and have booked tens and tens and tens of millions of dollars in savings uh, since that's been put in place. I think almost two years after it was supposed to be in place uh, according to state law. Um, when we look at the overpayments for chemical uh, dependency treatment, um, we now have $61 million that the states are on the hook for and $8.8 .8 million that the counties are on the hook for. Well, I just talked to my folks at Sherburne County and, and what their share is. They don't have the money. They, you know, it's, they, can, they turn their pockets inside out, mm -hmm. um, but, but they don't have their share of $8.8 .8 million uh, to repay to the feds. Um, and so we can continue to say, well, it's one-tenth of one percent. It's a small amount. It's this or that. But at the end of the day, at the bottom line, when someone has to cut a check to pay that money back, the tribes don't have the money, the county doesn't have the money, the state's going to be left holding the bag at the end of the day. And so we can quibble whether it's $150 million or $106 million or, or I, think, I think larger. <clears throat> I think larger. Um, we can quibble about that. But what the top healthcare policy minds wrap themselves around all summer long, all summer long and into the fall, and they don't have an answer yet, is where to come up with $20 million for an in emergency insulin program. With that money's out the door five times over, just in this PowerPoint presentation. And so we can talk about one-tenth of one percent, and we can minimize the impact. That is five emergency insulin programs. Gone. So I, I guess I get frustrated. And maybe I'm worked up because uh, I know I won't be here uh, this spring to, to continue to work on this. But I, I, think, I think there are real concerns. And, and I've been here now for multiple administrations and multiple commissioners to come in and tell us that, you know, we've really all got it figured out now. This time we're going to solve it. Um, you, you point through the process improvements that worked in some other areas and that you're confident we'll fix this. I, I remember when I think it was $27 million of Minnesota CARE um, premiums the state never collected and then decided not to try to collect anymore. They just stopped trying. Um, and so that was after those process improvements. So I, my concern is that there are real fundamental issues. And the more we try to minimize it, and the more we try to downplay it, and the more we just say, well, it's just this, or it's not that much in the grand scheme of things, I think you are um, stopping the, what really needs to happen for a full, deep dive analysis of the department. And so for a few months, um, I've been pushing a full and complete forensic audit of the Department of Human Services when we met uh, with the Office of the Legislative Auditor, um, uh, James Nobles talked about how their audits are not 
full and complete. They are not in depth. They are surface level uh, look throughs to make sure of base compliance with federal law. Uh, Governor Walls has said that he supports the idea of a full forensic audit. I think most, uh, uh, most recently, just on Friday night, uh, on uh, on Almanac. And so I'm wondering, Commissioner, um, where you stand uh, in the process of of working with the legislature to fund a full and complete forensic audit of the Department of Human Services. Commissioner. Yep, Chair Liebling, Representative Zerwas. Um, I, I wasn't tracking every example you had from the past in your years uh, here on, in the House, but I have to say, first and foremost, I do not minimize $106.5 million. And I have said what I've said here, that I am deeply sorry to our community partners, tribes, and counties and individual Minnesotans who've been impacted by these errors, and we need to get to the bottom of them, and every dime matters. I'm not suggesting in any way that these are small issues and don't deserve our full attention. This slide was simply to put into perspective that it's not every single thing the department does and that we have millions, billions of appropriate payments coming out of the department as well. But we still have major issues with the tribes and the counties, especially right now. And we're going to have a, a very serious conversation about how we're going to resolve those outstanding problems because they're not at all obvious as to what we're going to do to, for tribes that can't make those payments and counties that would struggle to make those payments. And we still have to all figure that out. And so uh, that's the next really hard work, I think, ahead of us in this whole area is to figure out how to deal with those particular outstanding issues. Um, as far as audits are concerned, um, I think you know that we have our internal auditors, we have the legislative auditor, we have CMS auditors who, who audit us regularly, and we often contract outside for other independent auditors. Um, and Governor Walls and I have both said we welcome all of those audits, they just make us stronger. Um, I would love to talk to someone, perhaps you've thought more about this, um, about what it would mean to do a full deep dive forensic audit of the entire department. My experience, and I've talked to other people uh, who do auditing, you know, um, auditors who do annual audits for corporations only take samples of the work that they do. Um, and I had one person suggest to me it would take years, five to 10 years to do a forensic audit of every single thing in the Department of Human Services. So I, I'm not sure we're on the same page about what that would look like or what that means to even know how to how to pursue that. Representative Zerwas, follow up. Well, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And I guess question for uh, the commissioner, are you able today to tell this committee when the last time the program in which the $29 million overpayment uh, for uh, chemical dependency, when that program was last audited. Are you prepared today uh, to tell uh, this committee when the chemical dependency treatment providers uh, program uh, with the $61 million by the county and the $8.8 .8 million owed back to the feds, when that program was last audited. Are you prepared to tell today the committee today when the MinCare enrollee program uh, with $3.7 million in overpayments was last audited. Are you prepared uh, to, tell, uh, uh, to tell this committee today when the last audit of the, uh, I think, 600 programs uh, with $52 million in document in grants going out uh, was audited uh, with the 16A uh, exclusions when the, each of those programs were audited um, because if you can give us a list uh, today or in the coming week of when those programs were last audited and uh, and these issues it was before these issues rose then I think we got everything under control and there's nothing to worry about but if you can't provide this committee a list of dates of when these programs were last audited that predate the uh, occurrence of these problems, well then I think we're not auditing enough and what we are auditing are catching the problems. And so that's why I'm pushing for a full and complete audit, uh, Madam Chair, um, and I hope the rest of the committee 
will join myself and Governor Walz uh, on that request. The governor said twice that he wants the full department audited, and I think we ought to work with the governor on helping him make that happen. Thank you, Representative Zeros. I just want to point out that the Office of the Legislative Auditor is under the control of the legislature. And I, I don't know if the commissioner has a list, but any particular program, as, as for example, the child care program, you know, there's a process by which members can request program audits and financial audits. And the auditor also does an annual, what they call the uh, single audit which is of the whole of state government. Now, you know, probably, as the commissioner noted, you, an audit doesn't mean that you do every, every, everything. But, um, you know, a lot of this actually is in the legislature's control. So I don't know if she has a list of when these various things were audited, but many of them were probably audited by the Office of the Legislative Auditor. And I really encourage members, if there's a particular program, even if you don't think something's wrong, you just want to understand better how it works, a really good way to do that is to recommend it to the Legislative Audit Commission when we do that process uh, to have a deep dive done. And there, you know, th some of those are extremely helpful. So um, thank you, Representative Zerwas. Well, I think, Madam Chair, just to be clear, uh, with the chemical dependency overpayment uh, to the two tribes, um, I spoke directly and specifically to uh, the Office of Legislative Auditor and Auditor nobles who'd said they had not previously audited that program. So there, there are plenty of programs uh, operating within DHS that have not been audited by the OLA. I think we could piecemeal it uh, together in the legislature, could piecemeal it together. The governor supports a, a full audit of the department. Um, I would hope that the governor's appointee would support his position on that, but you know, that's not the information we're getting uh, today, so we might have to rectify that with the governor. But I just think moving forward, I think it would be so much easier um, for the legislature if we started at ground zero. I think this drip, 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 drip of problems is, is really, really challenging, especially with the uh, overall needs and challenges uh, that the department faces that I think... Um, if we, if we really drill in, if we really focus in, and we're able to root out all of the concerns and all of the issues and then move forward, I think that's the best approach for everyone. Well, thank you, Representative Zerwas. And, you know, I appreciate that. And I, I think that, um, you know, the, one of the commissioner stated big goals is to have the department really be trustworthy. And so I, I think that uh, audits are a very appropriate way to do it. The legislative auditor that I've mentioned is, of course, not the only audit, only way audits get done, as she said. There is internal auditing, there are external audits, there are federal audits. And um, no, I'm not sure that um, it's as simple as it might sound to just, oh, let's just audit top to bottom because we have so many things going on. But I think all of us really, really share an interest as she has said, in making sure that every public dollar is spent in the way it's intended to be spent. We will never have enough money uh, for all the things we need to do. And if we're wasting any of it, that one dollar wasted is too, too much. I think we all absolutely agree with that. By the way, I also want to note, just because it's relevant to your comment about the counties and the, the struggles that they, they are really concerned, I know, about having to pay back money, which, just to be clear, the, this issue about the um, what we call the IMDs. So this is an issue about which entity pays, right? I know that for the public, we don't want to get this confused with anything about, this is not fraud, this is not misappropriation. This is just a dispute or a misunderstanding about which entity pays. Um, so there was, I'm not sure who made the decision, but certain mental health providers are being paid, we thought, with federal money the Fed said, no, we're not paying. Now it comes back to the state. And when the state pays, there's a county share. And so that's suddenly the state has to pay money it didn't, we didn't know it had to pay, and the counties have a share. And that share comes to what it's about here on the sheet, 8.8 .8 million. I just want to notify the committee of another kind of um, very similar issue that arose in our HHS budget bill 
there was an error made, a drafting error, having to do with an inconsistency with a start date, the state is taking over some the county share for certain chemical dependency uh, issues and really straightening out the lines of payment, which should really make things a lot simpler in the future. And, um, um, and in this, there was a, a date that was um, inadvertently set, I think, to 2020 when it was supposed to be 2019. And that is actually going to cost the counties $9 million. So this is 8.8. .8, that's nine. Now, normally when there's a, an error in a bill like that, the chairs of the committees can write a letter and say, we realize this is an error to DHS. You know, we, we realize it's an error. We intend to fix it in the next round. Go ahead and send out the money the way we intended. I signed such a letter. My counterpart in the Senate refused to sign that letter, even while recognizing that it's an error. So the counties are getting a double whammy right here, but nine million of that is fixable very, very easily. Unfortunately, uh, she has not felt the need to do that. So if you can prevail on her, I'm not gonna name her in this hearing, if you can prevail on her to sign such a letter, it was clearly an error, it will alleviate some of the pain for the counties. I'm not sure the money is distributed exactly the same way, of course, but we don't need to hit them twice. Anyway, Commissioner, did you want to comment? No. Oh. Okay. All right. Uh, next on the list. Oh, did Representative Schultz, did you want to say yeah, something to you, that Madam point? Thank you, Madam Chair. I just want to uh, say something to that point, and that is that, you know, a lot of this money was not wasted. It was used to purchase necessary services for individuals. So it's not like it was just out the door and wasted. We were buying something and helping people with a lot of that money. So um, I just want to remind people of that, that a lot of people needed uh, substance abuse treatment or mental health treatment, and th that's what those dollars were used for. All right. And I mean, just to be, Madam yeah. Chair, Madam Chair, just to be clear, in the chemical dependency treatment uh, with, the, with the two tribes, we were paying 300 some dollars a day for people to take medication themselves at their own home. So you could say that wasn't wasted. You could say that, but we were paying the state of Minnesota and the feds, mainly the feds, were paying $356 a day for an individual that had previously seen a physician, got a prescription to go home and sit on their couch or at their dining room table or every morning pull out of their vanity a bottle of pills, take one and put it on the counter, pour a cup of water and take the pill. And we paid them $356 a day for that service. So we can say that it wasn't a waste of money and we got a service for that. The federal government said that what we did by setting that rate was against the law and wholly inappropriate. Okay. I mean, that's, that's what happened. Yeah. Okay. Represent, I don't want to stop this conversation, but I just want to point out we have about 15 minutes left. I'm going to tell you who's on the list, okay? Haley, Schumacher, Baker, Franson, Halverson, Schultz, Hamilton, and Knorr. So I just want to, I want us to move on, okay, if, that, if we can. And we'll probably return to this maybe in some other members' questions as well. Representative Haley. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you for being here, Commissioner. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'd like to talk about some specific programs. You know, we've had a lot of things come up this summer or fall, and our constituents read about a DHS you know, issue almost every week in the paper. Mm -hmm. And they call all of us and say, what are you doing about it? Uh, so I'd like to highlight some of the bigger issues that have been overlooked uh, sometimes in the grand scheme of things. Um, in September, DHS overcharged people for Minnesota <clears throat> care when they were no longer in the program. A few days later, it was reported that DHS paid for dead people to receive Minnesota care. And just a few weeks ago, DHS announced that you would be returning cash assistance overpayments to people, even though they were in fact overpayments. So when the public reads this, DHS overpaid, collected the money back, and then decided to repay the overpayment. It's very difficult for the pu public to trust 
that these programs are not being run without fraud and mismanagement. And when you uh, spoke today, and I appreciate the presentation and the detail and, and the work that's gone into 90 days, uh, I would like to see detail when you say uh, that you've had a stopgap program in place. Can we get a list of what those stopgap measures have been? Because what we have continued to hear about and read about are overpayments and, and misuse of funds. And the public is rightly outraged. All of these services are important to Minnesotans. Mm -hmm. And their taxpayer dollars are being spent to fund them. We want quality health care. We want child care programs. We want assistance for people struggling with chemical dependency. We all agree on that. But we have got to be assured that the funds are being used appropriately. Your statement about the agency being soft on processes and that you don't need everybody to dot the I's and cross the T's. I think you can have a culture where people are committed to the values of the workplace and also be committed to dotting the I's and crossing the T's. Because clearly that hasn't happened. And I know it hasn't happened on your watch. So I appreciate the difficult position that you are in. But it has happened under the previous administration for a decade. And you even stated that in your slides. Some of these things have been going on for a decade. So we are as responsible in this body to provide fiscal oversight to this agency. And yet, we have not been uh, given transparent data for over a decade. When we have to find out about a lot of these issues via a Channel 9 news report or from an auditor, we have not been dealt with with transparency, we have not seen accountability, and we have not seen leadership. So those three things are what I'm asking you for today and what the people I represent are asking for. And I'm looking for, frankly, are, do we have Gopher fans in the room? I'm looking for that P.J. Fleck moment where somebody says, the buck stops with me. I am accountable. I will communicate with you with transparency. I will lead, and I will get it done. We haven't had anybody give us that statement. So I would like to know if you have a list of the stopgap measures that are in place, if you have a full list of the funds that have been recovered. We, we would like a full list as well of the funds that are somehow floating out there and have been misused, because I don't think we agree on that number. Uh, we have data on uh, CCAP money that is still being spent to child care organizations that have fraudulently used the money in the past. So can you go back? How can you assure us that these programs are free of fraud and mismanagement? Commissioner. Um, Chair Liebling and uh, Representative Haley. If I didn't put a slide in here that says it specifically, let me say it now, the book stops right here. And we're planning to use the uh, best processes that we know and that have been proven in other organizations to tackle these issues and move forward in a more trustworthy way than we have seen in this area in over a decade. It'll take some time for those processes to prove themselves out and to get everything in place, uh, but it starts now. Stopgap means that it's hard for someone today to start a new payment without the signatures required and documented to be sure it's done well. So from this day on, this doesn't keep somebody from doing an audit looking back 10 years and still find something from eight years ago somewhere um, in the system. But um, from this day going forward, we have the best kinds of processes we know how to put together to prevent that in the future. We have our uh, process improvement team on it. We have our compliance department on it, which is a different group. We have our finance department on that and our IT systems all working together. But you won't have a feeling of trustworthy until you see that for a period of time. I don't know how else to, to say that. Um, I have been very impressed that these processes put in place three years ago in our direct care and treatment services have quieted the headlines around direct care and treatment. I've been impressed that these kinds of things put in place in Mincher had caused Mincher to um, have a picture perfect open enrollment process this fall. Our own MinCare re-enrollment process this fall has been um, seamless. 
And so I've seen these processes work in state government in recent years in the departments that I'm surrounded by and in DHS itself, which is why I am confident that they're the right steps to take for us to button this place up and make sure that it harms like a Swiss watch, as I said. But you won't believe it or feel it or have people around you believe it until they see it happening that way. I, I appreciate that. The only way to build trust is to be trustworthy over time. Okay, I'm gonna, um, we've got a number of members on the list. We have 10 more minutes. We could go over by just a few minutes if we need to, but I'm just gonna ask members to please be concise, because if we all make up speech, which I know we all love to do, including me, of course, but you know, uh, then we'll, we won't be able to get to all the members who wanna ask something. So Representative Schumacher. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, Commissioner, thank you for coming in today and um, the work that you're doing to, to turn things around here. And um, I just wanted to ask uh, for a little bit more detail on the culture piece of it. When we uh, have referenced the audits uh, previously in, in some of the questions and a lot of the news reports, there are consistencies all around, but one of the more concerning consistencies is the uh, complaint from um, the staff that are involved about the culture of the, of the organization as a whole. And I was wondering if you would be able to give us a little more detail on what that the issues within the culture are. And I know you referenced a couple of things in your slides about having a stronger management team and the um, encouraging people to bring problems to the surface. Uh, on top of what types of cultural issues that are there, just a little more detail on just how those are being addressed moving forward. Yep. First, I want to be really clear that when we talk about process improvements, we're going to expect signatures and documentation before we make, we start writing checks. And that is regardless of the culture around it, right? You don't have to like the person in the next department to have to get their signature before you start sending out money. And so the process control is meant to be um, agnostic to the culture and to be in place. And we have to follow that regardless. And then um, we're also working to make sure that people um, feel safe to bring things forward, even encouraged to bring things forward. I've been trying to model telling everyone about everything I found while I was there to demonstrate that we're planning to be completely transparent about these things. Um, I think good management is the very best antidote to people feeling um, badly about their workplace or feeling like they're not heard, is getting people in who've managed people and who know how to do that well. Um, on top of that, our employee vision statement, um, the uh, collaborative safety training that we're doing. So we're putting all kinds of things behind a stronger, healthier culture in the department. I think you're referring to uh, something in the OLA's report about two departments not talking together much or not wanting to. And um, that starts at the top. That starts with our senior management team that I plan to build into a team that does talk to each other and commits to that going forward and then continues to work that uh, through all of their organizations. So there's quite a few things on our list that we're doing all at the same time to have people feel like they're in a safe place to bring issues forward. Does that answer your question? Representative Schumacher. Uh, for now, yes, thank you. Yeah. All right, thank you. Representative Baker. Madam, <clears throat> excuse me, Madam Chair and Commissioner, thank you for being here. Uh, I'm going to uh, focus a little bit more on the uh, overpayment or the uh, mistakes that were being made for the $30 million in the tribal payments. Um, in the OLA report, it also talked about the layers and layers of bureaucracy, which made it impossible to sort of assign the responsibility to what happened. In fact, to quote the OLA, uh, there was a level of mismanagement and dysfunction within DHS that's extremely troubling because they were not able to find who was really responsible for this. One of the things they should have been doing was, was using the Minnesota Official Records Act, which they were not doing during that period of time. So we don't know who assigned this and who did the, the, the approval of these things at one time. So with that specific issue, and I, I have a short follow-up after this, Commissioner, uh, has anybody yet uh, been um, reassigned or disciplined for the mistake that obviously was made, uh, and 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 uh, I'll let you answer that first. Just has there been any changes in that department so that the recognition of a mistake was made, and has there been somebody reassigned? Commissioner, uh, thank you, Chair Liebling. Um, the, um, what has changed is this operation stopgap. 
so that people have to have signatures documented. We know who made every decision going forward. That's the first change that's been made. No one in the department has been disciplined for decisions made many years ago. I believe that the people of the Department of Human Services also need these processes in place so they know what their jobs are, they know how they're expected to manage these decisions, and they're not counting on institutional memory, relationships with each other, friendships across the department, but a process uh, that everyone has to follow to get this done right. Thank you, and, and to follow up on that, um, Madam Chair, thank you. I think what, what I've been struggling with this whole time is to give you the tools, the commissioner, that you need to get an operation running like a Swiss watch is going to be very challenging. There's a lot of spinning wheels in a watch, and you as a commissioner need to have the ability to start moving people around and moving the gears around to make them work better. What, what I struggle with is 7,300 employees at DHS, as you mentioned, 7,200 are probably doing an outstanding job, and they should be congratulated. My guess is today, and, and through other Senate hearings, you've got a lot of DHS employees glued to the screen watching us talk about this right now because they're, they're, they know that they haven't done everything perfect, and I get that. There are people that aren't doing the Minnesota, Health, uh, Minnesota Official Records Act. They should have known that. They did know that, and they weren't doing it. I think a commissioner that wants respect in that agency is going to have to make changes appropriate changes. I'm not saying everybody's got to get terminated that we're a part of that, but reassign because we have to hold people accountable. Our citizens at home are holding us accountable to figure this out. So my question to you, Commissioner, is do you need our help or do you need more uh, ability to go to more of a mid-manager level and make changes without having other things get in the way like collective bargaining or things that make it hard for you to make this agency rock solid. Is that something that you think you need as a commissioner to make the changes that are appropriate for this kind of uh, level of, of uh, overpayments and mispayments? Those are good questions and I don't know yet. I do know that in managing large organizations in the past, the absolute number one piece is getting the right people on the bus, as they say, at the senior level and making sure that they have the right people reporting to them. Uh, people often ask me about how one person can manage all of this department. There's no way that one person manages this department. We need strong managers of every level in the department, and that's job one right now. Thank, Thank you, you, Commissioner. Thank you, Representative Baker. Representative Franson. Thank you. Madam Chair, uh, so while this committee is meeting um, regarding the chaos and as I like to call DHS right now a dumpster fire, Governor Walls um, held a press conference addressing bold action on climate change. Um, he's putting a new subcommittee uh, forward. Um, instead, I am disappointed that the governor is not here in this committee um, because we need bold action. Uh, in not only this department, but all of our departments on protecting our tax dollars. And uh, there has been no bold action on protecting our tax dollars. Uh, and just to piggy off a little bit about what Representative Munson was um, getting at with uh, the fraud in the child care assistance program, mm -hmm. an issue that I have been uh, working on. Um, I'd have to say I'm a little disappointed Pointed in regards to the comments I heard uh, with a lack of um, insight on uh, the fraud or uh, even terrorism, a possible terrorist mm. links. This is this is um, some of my data practices that I have received in this folder. Um, I am still waiting on 27 unfilled requests, but some of the stuff that I have received, I have I have tweeted out. Um, there's a nice thread on some of the issues that I found. And, you know, um, remember our, our um, Scott Stillman that was the whistleblower, everyone? Everyone remembers Scott Stillman. Uh, he was an employee of uh, the DHS. And um, when he uh, brought forward some of these issues of fraud, uh, he was he's a disgruntled employee. That's how the public was gaslighted. That's how Scott Stillman was uh, gaslighted. Uh, he was a whistleblower, not protected. Um, but however, in this data practice request, um, DHS officials back in 2014 were warned that public program dollars may be leaving the U.S. and getting in the hands of dangerous people. I have um, 
a memo that says it was possible that a portion of all the money, regardless of its source, that was sent or brought to some African, Middle Eastern, and Southwest Asian countries was being diverted to terrorist organizations. I have uh, and another email. Representative Franson, I'm sorry, but is there a question? Because we have other members, and please ask your question. We don't have time for a speech now. Well, there's not. I, you know what? But please, Madam please Chair? wrap it up. I'm okay. Well, then we will go on to the mismanagement of DHS when um, the Office of Foreign Asset Control kicked back a payment to a child care center because it appeared that the owner of the child care center was associated with the Taliban, which is why the account was ordered frozen. Um, but yet DHS, the Department of Human Services, considered mailing a check for the amount to the child care center uh, about approximately $24,000, even after all this, which was quite maddening. Um, and then we still have the Inspector General, Carolyn Ham, who was pay, um, been paid $42,000 to sit at home. Now she's brought back to work, working at the Department of Human Services. So I am just kind of wondering here, what um, additional protections need to be enacted to ensure fraud is caught and prosecuted? Prosecuted is very key here because there seems to be a bunch of fraud and uh, we're pretty laxy daisy here. I see we've got a we got a whole new committee on equity and inclusion. Not sure how that's going to handle um, addressing fraud, but we're growing government because of the sake of growing government. Um, many in the legislature have uh, repeatedly called on um, to make the inspector general office separate from DHS because of concerns of being pressured from higher ups in the DHS. Uh, how will you ensure that the Inspector General will be able to do their work without um, pressure from other parts of DHS? And will you support an independent OIG so that they can do the work that needs to be done to make sure that our tax dollars are protected without fear of retaliation or being sent through yet another implicit bias uh, course, which I am still waiting on the data practices for that as well. I, I think that we need um, answers here. And what is the status of the investigation to Carolyn Ham? We don't know. I mean, so as in July, we were Okay, told, oh, so we have a so question there, Representative France, and that I'll ask the commissioner to address, the, to address that question. Um, I do want to say, first of all, you mentioned you wanted the governor to come to this committee. I want to say in my 15 years, I've never seen that. The governor is the executive branch. <laughs> we have the commissioner here as a representative of the executive branch. I've never seen a governor show up at a committee hearing ever. But um, anyway, uh, I think there was a question in there, Commissioner. Why don't you go ahead and answer that, and then I'm going to try to get to the other four members who wanted to ask a question. Chair Liebling, Representative Franson, I understand that the OLA's report was unable to substantiate an allegation that individuals in Minnesota sent CCAP fraud money to a foreign country where terrorist organizations obtained and used the money. That's all I know about that. The complaints against Carol and Ham were recently closed and resulted in no disciplinary action. Carolyn remains on leave from the Inspector General's office and is assigned to the DHS General Counsel's office. Okay, uh, Representative Halverson. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. A um, couple things I just um, wanted to say um, from the outset, um, from some things I've heard. Um, I need to clarify uh, that there isn't, uh, we are not going to create a magic pot of taxpayer money to fund the emergency insulin program um, based on this conversation. And I don't want anybody to um, derail our conversations about what people with diabetes need um, it, within the context of this conversation. We are dealing with um, patients who are having trouble getting medicine because the medicine um, is too expensive. The manufacturers charge too much money for it. Um, to say that we're going to put taxpayer money toward it um, in the context of this conversation um, really derails the work that's been done um, because both the House and the Senate have agreed that the manufacturers have to be part of the solution. I just wanted to put that out on the record. Um, the other thing is um, I want to be really clear with regard to um, what the audits have found um, regarding any um, 
uh, quote unquote funding of terrorist organizations by any uh, state of Minnesota um, payments. Um, there has been zero evidence. Zero. Um, if there is additional um, audits that people want to do, um, uh, go forth. But um, you know, our our uh, auditor um, that is under the control of the Minnesota House of Representatives said, in no uncertain terms, there is zero evidence to support that. Um, it is uh, dangerous and it is inappropriate for any member of the House of Representatives to say, "Well, what if? Well, I've heard. Well, this." We're here to collect evidence. We're here to get to the bottom of problems. And um, uh, adding those kinds of uh, uh, statements of misinformation that can't be substantiated, um, I feel are really inappropriate in the context of this conversation. Mr. Halverson, I'm so sorry to cut you off as well, but did you have a question for the I commission? do have a question, okay. Madam Chair. Um, I actually wanted to switch back to some of the um, work that is going to happen with regard to um, the nature of care and um, the oversight committee and listening committee that um, the commissioner is putting together. Um, I heard you say that uh, uh, Bill George of Medtronic is going to um, lead this effort, which is great, along with some legislative leaders. Um, I also know that the nature of care has really changed over the years, both um, through law and I think through our values. Um, we are looking at a much more patient-centered um, care, and so I wanted to see, um, Commissioner, how you see um, the caregivers and employees of, of uh, the, the um, DHS along with um, uh, members of the public who are uh, recipients of DHS services are part of this conversation as well. Commissioner. Thank you. I just want to be very clear that the advisory panel that we mentioned with relation to Bill George co-chairing is going to be um, taking our 90-day report from here and going forward, reviewing our progress and advising me on restoring trustworthiness through the various things that we've said we were going to do. Uh, so they're not going to be looking at healthcare policy or care system policy really going forward as much as they're really working on where does our department go next with these things we've set out to do and how much progress are we are we making um, and the second piece about the second piece you asked was about Ma Madam Chair, uh, regarding uh, um, adding the voices of people who are receiving services, employees, yes, caregivers to thank this you. conversation. I discovered as soon as I started in the position that I'm a member or a chair of over 30 Blue Ribbon Commission interagency task forces and advisory boards. And so we spend hours and hours every week listening to citizens across the state. Most of those are set up to be cross-sectional and, and geographically diverse. And so we, we have lots and lots of ways um, every week to be listening to people across the state on the major issues that, that matter to them. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, I have Schultz, Hamilton, Knorr. Representative Schultz, you'll pass. Um, Representative Hamilton. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, just to put things in perspective, the money's in question is the entire uh, budget for the Agriculture Department, uh, Commissioner Peterson's entire budget. So, like you said, it is significant. Um, over the years, you, you build solid working relationships, and I had a great deal of respect for uh, former Commissioner Laurie. And last summer, when I heard two deputy commissioners resign, and then subsequently Commissioner uh, Laurie resigned, and then I believe there was um, a couple that uh, rescinded the resignation. I would simply like to know why. What was taking place? If you could shed some light on that. Actually, I can't. I've never had that conversation with them. And um, I've just come into the position and wanted to move forward. I would suggest that instead of resigning and coming back, uh, they decided not to resign. Um, and, and then since then, um, Chuck Johnson has decided to stay on a, on a regular basis in his position. But I have never asked him what happened then. Thank you. Uh, Representative Hamilton. Okay. Um, Representative Noor. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and congratulations, Commissioner Hofstede. Um, you have inherited one of the best departments in the state because I was one of the employees at the, at the department. <laughs> I know how hard they work, and um, I think we're missing so many points. Nobody has talked about the system modernization, the METS, the MMIS, DCT, the integrated systems, which we have failed to invest as a state. 
most of the problems that we talk about, nobody talks about one in five, approximately one in five Minnesotans receives human services. Children, families, uh, disabled individuals, vulnerable individuals that you are taking care of as a state. We tend to look into programs and resources and not look at the outcomes of what we're doing as a state. So we need to start examining, are we really investing in the right process? Are we investing in outcomes that can help individuals succeed? And quite frankly, I am disgusted by some of the conversation about terrorism, Taliban, and all those things. Those have been debunked. Those are not true. The hate, the fear, the Islamophobia that exists needs to stop now and forever. We can no longer continue to have those types of conversation in this house, period. I think people need to provide facts instead of attacking other communities when they were mentioned, different communities. That's unreal. I will no longer take those statements without any facts produced by those individuals who make those statements. Let's be humans, the humanity that connects all of us. So the other piece that I wanted to, I'm glad that you've talked about the departments embracing diversity, inclusion, and equity. But we also know that the department lags the ability to recruit, retain, and even hire individuals of people of color indigenous. It's a fact that I know because I've worked there. It's time for us to look into how we're going to address the implicit biases, not only in this committee, but also at the department. Let's value the people that we serve. We're better than this Minnesotans. And I'm hoping that we'll have a comprehensive information about system modernization for the state of Minnesota when it comes to technology and how to serve the people that I just mentioned. Let's look at ways of where we can collaborate and help the state and not things that tend to degrade the same people that we're trying to serve. So thank you so much, Commissioner. I'm not expecting any uh, response to that, but I'm hoping to work with you collaboratively and also establish those relationships, relationships, relationships with the communities that we serve. Thank you so much. Thank you, Representative Nora. I've got Representative Schultz, and then I wanted to give Representative Zerwas a moment to uh, say a few words. Representative Schultz. Thank you, Madam Chair. Well, I just want to say that, you know, there's so much waste in health care, and when we look at relative to our overpayments, to the overpayments we make to pharmaceutical companies for the price of drugs and how much we could save and redirect to other purposes. So I, I want to just say that, but also I want to thank the commissioner for putting people first. And I know that um, we do conduct a lot of audits, financial audits and program audits, and we have um, very limited resources to do those audits. And um, I want to, I just want to ask the commissioner one thing is what has most impressed you in your last 90 days with DHS about the agency? And um, what can we do? Um, what do you think personally we can do to make your job easier as you <laughs> look at the agency and try to improve our oversight and accountability? Commissioner? Well, Chairman Liebling and Representative Schultz, wow. Um, I think my observations early in my presentation of visiting services that we not only uh, fund but also provide have been um, some of the most impressive things I've seen. It's great to get out of the office once in a while and go out and see why we do this work to uh, keep us going. I have been impressed with the capacity of the department. I used to say that Lutheran Social Service was large and had lots of things going on. It was hard to understand everything they did. It's incredible to look across the Department of Human <laughs> Services and to see all the work that goes on and all the people's lives impacted for the better uh, through the work. Um, I, I have experienced the department to be, um, as I mentioned, innovative and creative in developing models like IHPs and CCBHCs and all the new uh, healthcare and community service integration services and the conversations we've been having around that. Um, I've been impressed with the talent in the department that's been able to come together around tables and work on solving many of these problems. 
and frankly been impressed with how quickly we've been able to put up stopgap Operation Swiss Watch, et cetera, for the talent we already had in the department. My expectation was that perhaps we were going to have to go outside somewhere and get someone to come in and teach us how to control these processes and to discover that we not only have the skills in the department, but they have a track record of having already done them um, has been impressive. Um, what you can do best, um, I would just say, um, Give us a chance to be trustworthy and to demonstrate that trustworthiness and to put that trustworthiness back together and um, give us a chance to breathe and give our employees the space to do that. Um, and we intend to make good on that uh, for you and for all the people of Minnesota. Thank you very much, Commissioner. We all appreciate your work and uh, look forward to seeing you go from success to success. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, so, members, before we adjourn, of course, this will be, I think, the last committee hearing for Representative Zerwas, who's been such an important, valued member of this committee. And I just wanted to give him a few words, a few, an opportunity to say a few words, because you won't be able to do that on the House floor, which is usually what you get to do before yeah. you retire. So Nothing will be spared on the floor. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, no, I think, Madam Chair, obviously, thank you so much for... Uh, for being gracious and, and, and allowing me to have a few uh, moments. Um, running for the legislature, I don't think it's anything anyone ever decides to do, uh, like a, a big goal or, or, or dream. I, um, after college, moved back uh, to Elk River, and I was involved uh, on the Elk River uh, City Council. And uh, my dad had been police chief in Elk River for 23 years we'd grown up there. The city had bent over backwards uh, to take care of and accommodate uh, my family, especially in the years uh, when I was so sick to the point of allowing my dad every day to set up a mini uh, police chief office in my ICU hospital room uh, for the five and a half months I was at Habit, um, where he would come down there uh, each day. And so for me, um, I wanted uh, to do some public service, and I wanted uh, to represent uh, the community in which I lived. And I think like any city council member, you get there and you think, oh, this would be a lot easier if the people down in St. Paul weren't screwing everything up. <laughs> then I think you get down here and go, oh, it'd be a lot easier if the feds didn't screw everything up. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not running for Congress. <laughs> um, but uh, so, so I came down here uh, really by by happenstance of following redistricting in an open uh, seat. I told the story a few times in the last couple of weeks. I wasn't overly uh, politically active uh, prior to being uh, elected. Um, and so I got here and the Republicans had come into the uh, minority of everything. And I didn't really know that many people. And there were some issues I cared about and, and didn't feel like I even knew the folks on on my side of the aisle that well. And so every day I would take a few uh, pieces of candy and stuff it in my coat pocket and walk around the floor of the house with uh, green jackets talking about what I was working on and um, trying to get co-authors and, and in some ways bribing people with, with chocolate and, and Sour Patch Kids. And um, eventually, a few weeks in, one of our first late nights, um, I had a few members come over to my desk and say, you know, Zerwas, you got any candy? <laughs> and, and so that's when I just started uh, stocking my, my desk drawer. And um, I think for me, um, it, it kind of sums up what, what my goal has been. Um, I, have, I have really tried over the last seven uh, years uh, to dig in uh, to some challenging issues and, and difficult issues and when possible, improbable, um, uh, reach a hand out across the aisle, with, sometimes with candy and sometimes not. <laughs> but, uh, um, to, and, and to work with members um, as much as possible. Um, and I'll tell you, the, the years I've spent in the minority, I've been able to dig into bigger policy issues um, I think with that approach, then even the years that I served, the four years I served in the majority, I think because they're just so busy doing 
kind of the must-do stuff that gets put on the majority uh, members. And so um, that wouldn't be possible without the great uh, friendships and relationships that I've been able uh, to create and forge uh, across both sides of the aisle. Um, I'll do the, the ubiquitous thing that every retiring member has to do, which is to say thank you, thank you, thank you um, to our partisan staff, our nonpartisan staff, um, the folks that are here way before we get here and are here long after uh, we leave. And I, can, uh, I can't count uh, the number of times uh, Randy Chun or, or others in a very gracious or polite way said, you sure you want to do that? <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you sure your bill wants to say that? <laughs> and, uh, um, the, the folks uh, that do the bulk of the heavy lifting in this space um, are, are behind the scenes, um, and, they, and they help us um, come to really good policy conclusions and make us look really, really good. Mm -hmm. um, it's been an honor of a lifetime serving, um, but I think I'm going to find even more fun uh, spending those late evenings at home with uh, with Jackson and with Bet, who, uh, without their support, the last few years um, through kind of a challenging time in in my life, uh, both medically and and just life, um, I won't have been able to serve uh, this long. So I owe everything uh, to my, my friends and my family and, uh, and to the colleagues I've met along the way. And so thank you very, very much uh, for being gracious enough uh, to let me work on the issues I care about over these last few years. Well, thank you. I just want to thank you, Representative Zerwes. You have been a very valuable member of this committee and other committees and of the <coughs> Minnesota House. It really has been uh, wonderful, and uh, we all wish you lots of good luck. And when we're working those late nights, we'll be thinking of you. I hope you're not <laughs> sitting up watching us. You should be <laughs> putting your child to bed and uh, enjoying those really precious yeah, times with your family. And uh, But we, we do thank you so much for all the good work that you've done here in the Minnesota House. With that, members, thank you all. We are adjourned.